Um, we're going to start Romans chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 3 through 8. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Amen. So if you would join with me as we pray over tonight. Father, we love you and we're so thankful. Thankful for this rain. Uh, we thank you for your your blessing on everyone in agriculture too, our farmers and their crops. Um, Father, we thank you for blessing them. And as we gather tonight, coming to uh, to receive from you, I know that you don't disappoint. And so, Lord, I pray that our church we would uh, we would receive all that you desire for us, that we would walk in all that you desire for us, that we would see our church built up and strengthened by your spirit in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So tonight, I'm really excited. We're starting a new series that we've been planning for some time now. And over the next several weeks, we're gonna be diving into the spiritual gifts. And so I, we're gonna be hearing from someone different each week as uh, as we dive into those gifts, each week looking at three to four gifts. And uh, our, our hope through this series is that you will discover the gifts that God has given to you. And maybe you already know what some of those gifts are, and that's great. Keep coming and don't check out because you may learn something that helps you equip other people. So uh, pay attention, you know, keep coming if you already know them, but if you don't, maybe you get to discover them over the, the course of the next few weeks. And then also how you can develop in the gifts that God has given you. And so that's kind of where we're going through the series. And my, my goal for tonight is to just kind of give an introduction as to what gifts we're gonna be covering and the foundation for how those gifts are used. And so since I'm setting like setting the tone and people behind me are counting on me saying certain things and clarifying certain things so that they don't have to take the time to do it. I'm going to stick to my notes a little closer than I normally do tonight. And that's so that I don't miss something. Okay. So, uh, so bear with me in that. So the, the gifts that we're going to be covering through this series come from Romans chapter 12, Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12. And so we're just going to briefly display on the screen the gifts that, that are listed in each of those passages. And so uh, if, you, if you don't write them down fast enough, you probably won't unless you're just taking a picture of them. Don't worry, don't sweat it, because this is what we're going to be covering for the next couple months, okay? So from Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, we see the gifts of prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, giving, and leadership. So that was the, the text that we read earlier. In Ephesians 4, 11, we find gifts that Jesus gave the church in the form of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Give you guys a little bit of time if you're taking notes. I, on the next one, you're just not, you're not gonna get it all written. So uh, just write down the reference. You can go find it on your own. But in 1 Corinthians 12, verses eight through 10, Paul speaks of nine spiritual gifts. Those are words of wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, healings, miracle, uh, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. And then later on in the same chapter, verses 28 through 29, Paul gives another list of gifts, which include apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healing, helping others, administration, and tongues. Okay, so... Even though there are 
uh, other places in the Old Testament and in the New Testament where we see God giving supernatural abilities for people to do certain things, we're going to be focusing on the gifts from those three passages. And, uh, and so, yeah, that may be a bit more of, exp- of an expansive list than what you're used to. Um, or we're not gonna cover them all. We're gonna do what we can in the time that we have. Uh, in all of those, those passages, we see common language. Paul uses the metaphor of the body. He uses the language of gifts. But in all of those passages, the most common word that you're going to see, more common than Jesus, more common than God, more common than the spirit, more common than the word gifts is the word one, okay? There's probably a reason for that. So because even though we have difference of perspectives, of giftings, we have different functions, we are all part of one body, okay? We have to know that before we head into the rest of this. And we're to let those differences, those different gifts, those different perspectives, those different functions, we're to let those gifts actually strengthen the body, not divide the body, okay? Because the, what often happens is people take the easy route of just finding a church that is congruent to their giftings, as opposed to the hard work of leading a diverse community in which all of the gifts have their place, okay? That's the, that's the harder work because there is, there is some tension within the gifts. Um, one of the things that I want to point out here is that tension actually makes the body stronger. Um, in, in your physical body, if you didn't have tension in your body, you would just be, yeah, I was, what came to mind was a wet noodle, but I was trying to find a, a better image to get like a ragdoll. I don't know. But like, if you didn't have tension in your body, you couldn't do anything. Uh, it's the tension in your muscles and your ligaments that actually gives you the ability to move. Uh, same goes with the, the body of Christ. There is a built-in tension within some of the giftings. Okay, so like pastors and evangelists, for example. Pastors are passionate about the, the flock that's here. Okay, caring for the flock that's here. The evangelists are passionate about the one that's not here. You know, and so because of that, their, their giftings can create a tension. Uh, there can be tension between people who have the gift of administration and people who have the gift of mercy. Okay, that one landed a lot better. You, that one, you, you know some people, okay? You have some stories there. Because one's about, you know, we need to do things in excellence and efficiency and all of this. And the other person's like, yeah, but they're still people. Okay, they're not just numbers, they're human beings. They're people here, okay? So there's, there's tension here, but we can actually, we can have, we can embrace that tension and have strength in unity. Uh, we can actually go for the, we can, we can care for the people who are here and still reach the people who aren't, okay? Whenever we, we can have a body in which the gifts are encouraged and not just, not, just, uh, not just a certain group and say like, hey, if, if your thing is, if, if you're passionate about uh, good teaching, then you're, you're gonna love it here. This is your place, whatever. If you're passionate about evangelism, you're gonna have to go somewhere else, okay? That's what a lot of people do, unfortunately. And now each, each house may have their, like may have their, their dominant gifts, but that doesn't mean that we need to exclude all the others, okay? There can be strength that comes from the diversity of those gifts. So we can also have things done at a high level of excellence while not having a pile of body bags behind us, okay? Because we have people who have the gift of administration who are able to step in and function in their gifts, and we have people who have the gift of mercy who are able to step in and function and their gifts. So how do we embrace this tension and have that strength in unity? 
It comes through maturity, okay? It comes through maturity. I don't know if you've been in church long enough to know that just because someone is gifted, it doesn't mean they're mature, okay? Most church splits involve somebody who's really gifted and really immature, okay? So just because someone is really gifted doesn't mean they're really mature, uh, that's where the fruit of the spirit, the character of the person. So like, as we go on this, this journey over the next couple of months, talking about the gifts of the spirit, we're going to do so without neglecting the fruit of the spirit. Okay. Character matters, but so do the gifts. And that's why we're going to be talking about the gifts. Also, just because a gift is more visible, uh, doesn't mean that it's more valuable. So uh, just because some gifts are more visible than others doesn't mean they are more valuable. Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 talks at length about how each member matters. The, the parts that are really visible, the parts that aren't. Uh, that he, all of them have value. And God created this interdependence in our physical bodies. Like they're in our physical bodies, each part depends on the other part. There is an interdependence. The same, is, the same goes with the body of Christ. He, he created the body to have an interdependence where we need to rely on each other. Uh, this is also how society works. Uh, our society is built to where we are one member, one individual within a larger society, okay? And because of that, there are so many benefits that come with that. So I don't have to know how to be a doctor, okay? I don't know how to have to perform surgical procedures on people I love that are counting on someone knowledgeable doing that, okay? I don't have to know how to be a mechanic. Thank God, okay? I can, I can do a few things, uh, but I don't have to take the time to know everything there is to know about my particular vehicles, okay? I don't have to know how to make my own clothing, Okay? There are things that because, uh, because we operate as one member of a larger part, um, we, we rely on each other in society. Imagine how limited our growth as a society would be if we didn't rely on anyone else for anything. Do you, know why, do you want to know why most churches aren't growing? because they are relying on just the pastor to be everything to everyone, or they're relying on just a handful of people to be everything to everyone. Okay? It takes all of us. Even in Texas, which is one of the most independent places on the planet, we still need to rely on one another if we're in the body of Christ. If we want to grow, that's the caveat. If you don't want to grow, then don't worry about this. Keep doing your own thing. Stay stagnant. Uh, then, you know, that's fine. If you want to actually grow, if you want the church to be uh, strengthened, then we have to step into this. For the body to grow and, to, and be healthy, it takes all of us. It takes all of us. It takes all of us stewarding the gifts that God has given us. And we don't, we don't choose the gifts that we're given. Uh, we don't choose them, but we steward them. Okay? I, I think that we can influence it because I, Paul says, you know, earnestly desire these gifts. And so I think there's a, a degree to which we can ask God for certain gifts. But at the end of the day, we don't get to pick and choose what we get. Okay? God is the one who, uh, who disperses those gifts as he sees fit, okay? So they're not ours to pick and choose, but they are ours to steward. The same with our, our natural abilities. I didn't, I didn't choose to have the natural ability to reach the top shelf, okay? <laughs> or to catch the spider webs in my face that no one else gets, okay? So I didn't get to choose that, um, in the same way, when it comes to things like pastoring and leading, I did, not, I did not choose those, okay? I did not choose to pastor. 
what I did is I responded to a call and I responded to a grace that God placed in my life. Okay? So, in that, I would be doing that whether I was on staff or not. Um, Those gifts and those callings are there. Uh, Any gift that God has given me isn't mine to possess, it's mine to steward. We're responsible for stewarding them. So, it, like, when you think of the gifts in terms of stewardship, it brings to mind the parable of the talents. Uh, what are you doing with what you have? Are you bearing your gift? Okay, are you playing it safe? Are you saying, God, I don't want to step out and make a mistake with this thing? Listen, uh, failure, I've heard it said like this failure is not an option, it's a necessity. Okay? If you want to grow, you have to be okay with failing. Failure is not an option. It's a necessity for growth. Okay? So if you're going to take the route of just playing it safe, then you're going to be like the steward who, who goes and buries the talent. Okay? So what are we doing with what we have? We need to be good stewards of them. It's God's role. By the way, I didn't give this caveat. Tonight's not going to be like a normal message. Um, it's just going to be super content heavy, okay? There's not going to be tons of stories and like kind of a typical message flow. It's just going to be kind of like a fire hose of content, okay? So uh, a lot of these points could be unpacked and had, have more time spent on them. We just don't have that time, okay? It's God's role to give the gifts. It's our role to desire them uh, to discover them and to develop them with God's, with God's help, like in partnership with him. He's the one who gives them. Our role is to desire them, as, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14. We desire them, we discover them, and we develop them. Like that's, that's our role. Uh, I love Proverbs 25 verse 2. It says, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it's the glory of kings to search a matter out. Uh, so it's, it's a fun thing that we get to do. Like God has placed, he has placed treasures on the inside of each of us. And now we get to go on the adventure of discovering what those things are. God has given every single one of us a gift. No one is exempt and no one is forgotten. Uh, there's not a single gift that we're going to be covering in this series that is exclusive for people who are on staff at a church. Okay? There are people in this room who have the gift of pastoring. And we need you to step into that gift. We need you to activate that gift before you get a title next to your name. Okay? Regardless if you have a title next to your name, regardless if you get a paycheck from the church, uh, you can step into the gifts that God has placed on the inside of you. Our church will be built up and strengthened by people in the body discovering and growing in their gifts. By the way, this is God's growth strategy for his church. He didn't give, them, uh, he didn't give the apostles a, a great marketing plan. Okay, he gave them gifts. This is how he grows his church. It's through empowering his people with his gifts. Not that marketing plans are bad, okay? But that's just not the method that God chose. He chose to give his people gifts to build his church. Must be a lot of marketing people. That didn't really fly, y'all. Uh, I love marketing, okay? It's, it's cool. You, you guys are great. Um, what would it look like if everyone in our church discovered their gifts and grew in them? What if everyone in our church was growing in their giftings? What would that do to our church? What would that do to our city? To see people in the city who have the gift of administration placed in positions of influence or people who have the gift of leadership placed in positions of influence and uh, in leadership in our communities. What would that look like? What would it look like for people who have the gift of miracles or healings to discover and to develop those gifts to where when people come down, like 
like our, our church services are flooded with people who are in need of God breaking through and doing something miraculous in their life. And they know that if they get here or wherever, like they know that there is something there that God has for them that is real. What would it look like for people who operate in words of knowledge to be in, like walking in Walmart or wherever and coming across people and saying, hey, you know, I, I, I don't want to sound weird here, but uh, something that I'm working on is I'm working on hearing God and I feel like God just told me something. And so feel free to like, feel free to say that this isn't the case, okay? But what I was hearing God say is, and you tell them something that only they would know. And in that moment, they have this, this revelation of God is real and he sees me. What would happen in our community? What would happen in our church if people who have the gift of teaching would take people who are new believers and they would teach them the word of God? Listen, the, the gift of teaching is not just something that happens here, okay? In fact, a lot of the gifts, if you, if you corner them into only looking a certain way, you're going to miss what God wants to do. If you think that in order for this gift to function, it has to be in this place, in this way, at this time, then you may miss opportunities that God brings for you to step into that and to grow in it. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think we have time. Some of the things that we'll be, we'll be covering, you'll notice, are things that millions of people do every day without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So on that list of things that Scripture referred to as spiritual gifts are things like leading, administrating, helping, serving, mercy, teaching. Like, I, I know a lot of people who don't know Jesus that are doing those things. Yet Scripture still refers to them as, or S Scripture still speaks of gifts that God gives for teaching and administration and leading and all of that. Why? Because there is a grace that God gives in the form of a gift that can take things that we can already do to a level that is far beyond our own capacity. That was Pastor Jacob's word for our church at Jubilee was God is increasing our capacity. And so even though it may be something that you look at and, you know, as we talk about certain gifts, whether that's administer, whatever, fill in the, the blank on some of those things. And you go, well, you know, I know people that are already doing this or already do this to a level. There is a grace that comes in the form of a gift that can take that to a level that you cannot do without God. Okay, a couple of examples. Look at Peter in the New Testament. When you look at his story, you see the qualities of a leader, Okay. He, even though sometimes it wasn't great, uh, but he was willing to, to be the first one to speak up or to step out, okay? You, so you see these qualities of leadership even before, uh, before he received the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But after, after he received the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, he led at a completely different level, okay? Completely different level. Look at Joseph in the Old Testament, clearly a grace on his life to administrate. Through his administrative decisions, countless lives were saved. Okay, and the reason that he, you know, he was able to, he wasn't able to forecast the famine because he went to some training seminar or because he read some book or because he did some training. Okay, there's nothing wrong with books, training. I, like, I do all of that. That's one of the ways that you can develop in, in gifts or grow in disciplines and skills, which are different. But, so there's nothing wrong with those things. But I'm just pointing that out so that you can see that there is a difference between the natural ability to lead or administrate and what happens whenever it's a supernatural gift. Because the reason he was able to do all of those things is because God gave him the ability to interpret dreams. Like you remove dream interpretation from Joseph and what happens? It's not the same result. Like no amount of like wit, sharpness, intelligence could have prepared him for what was happening. 
okay? But because God gave him a supernatural gift, he was able to administrate at a completely different level, okay? And what was the result of that? What happened? Well, there was blessing, there was prosperity in the land, like people didn't starve to death, okay? Lives were saved. Uh, There was forgiveness and reconciliation within a family. All of that came out of Joseph's decisions, okay? Forgiveness, reconciliation, um, blessing, all of that sounds like the character of God, okay? See, the, a gift displays the character of the giver. A gift displays the character of the giver. So if someone is stingy, you can tell in the gift that they give you or the gift that they don't give you, okay? Or if someone is loaded, but they're not connected, then you can tell in the gift because it's gonna be this nice expensive gift, but it, it doesn't connect with you. It has nothing to do with what you like or enjoy, okay? The good news is that God is a good gift giver, okay? He knows you and he gives you what you need and he gives it to you in abundance. Uh, So really a study on the gifts aren't just a study on the gifts, they're a study on God's nature and his character. And we're gonna see how each gift displays an aspect of God's character and his nature. Uh, Something that is at the core of God's character that we also find at the core of the teaching on gifts is love. And this is when I, when I talk about the foundation from which the, the gifts are to be built upon, this is that foundation and it is the love of God. Okay? Love that we receive from God is the foundation from which all of the spiritual gifts are to be built upon. We see this because in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, Paul says, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. The Holy Spirit came to us in love. Therefore, it should flow through us in the same manner. Okay. So the Holy Spirit came to us in love and therefore it should flow through us in the same way. It's not a coincidence that at the heart of Paul's teaching on the spiritual gifts to the church in Corinth, he takes time to talk about love. He calls it the more excellent way, okay? I wanna read a familiar set of verses, 1 Corinthians 13, verses four through seven, but I want you to hear this as a framework for how the gifts are to be exercised or how the gifts are to be practiced, okay? Love is patient and kind, Love doesn't envy or boast, okay? So when we are developing, when we are engaging, when we are practicing the gifts that God has given us, it's not about boasting in how great we are or envying that we're not as great as somebody else, okay? A lot of people never take the first step in growing in their gifts because they look at other people who are further along in their gifting and they go, man, I can't do it like they can. Like, since they're, they're that good, I'm just going to defer and I'm going to let them do it, okay? And I'm just going to sit on the sidelines. Well, that's not really an option, okay? God doesn't say, hey, here are the super gifted people and I'm going to rely on them to do everything. And then everyone who got the, the little gifts, uh, who, who got the short end of the stick, like you guys can just take it easy, Okay? He doesn't say that. He says every joint supplies, okay? Every member matters. So we're not going to, uh, we're not gonna envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. Listen, these gifts are not a badge of, of awesomeness, okay? The gifts God gives you are tools for serving. So because of that, we're not going to be arrogant because by the way, you didn't, like you didn't earn them. So why would you be so arrogant about having them? Okay, not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. If, if churches could get that down, uh, because the more gifted you are, the more you think you can insist on your own way, uh, which is not how it should be. Let me just clarify that. 
It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Paul goes on to say, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, he says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. We are to pursue love and along the way, earnestly desire the gifts. The difference is subtle, but it's important. Because when you get those two things backwards, it becomes a perversion. So I'll, I'll, I think about it like this, okay? In marriage, I am to pursue my wife. And along the way, earnestly desire the gifts that come with marriage. Amen. Okay, do I have to spell that out for you? Uh, there are gifts or benefits that come with being married. Okay, all right. You, just making sure we're on the same page here. The, the youth and the kids are in their own class. So if I needed to spell it out for you, I feel okay doing that. But do you see? So I pursue my wife. Like that's the aim. Pursuit of my wife. And along the way, like there are benefits or gifts that come along with it that, that are to be desired. But what happens when you flip that around and you begin to just pursue the gift over the relationship. See, when we pursue the gifts over the relationship, it becomes a perversion. Because in the marriage analogy, if, if the main goal is getting that benefit or that goal, then if I'm not getting it from my wife, then I'm gonna get it somewhere else. Like if that's the main goal. But instead, the main goal is I'm gonna pursue my wife. Like that's the main pursuit, okay? And then everything else just falls in place, whatever. But no matter what, I'm gonna pursue my wife, okay? So when it comes to the gifts, we are to pursue love. Like that is the primary aim, the primary goal. And along the way, God's going to give you gifts that, you are, that we are to desire to develop, to grow in. Uh, and when we pursue love and make that the main thing, uh, we cultivate the heart of a servant. Because love and operating the gifts is to be self-giving, not self-serving. Okay, see, when you get them backwards, when, when, you, when you seek to serve self, you flip it around. And it's all about how great you can look, how awesome you can be, whatever. It's not about self-serving, it's about self-giving. We cultivate the heart of a servant. And the spiritual gifts are how we serve like Jesus. It's how we serve like Jesus. Um, and when you make love the aim, cultivate the heart of the servant, then again, the, the spiritual gifts that we give aren't these badges of honor. They're tools in our tool belt that help us serve. Okay? So, question. If you're not serving people with what you can do, what makes you think that God would give you abilities to serve people with things that you can't do in and of yourself? Okay, if you have the heart of a servant, then the gifts are just one more tool in your tool belt to serve, um, as opposed to they're the main thing, they're the priority so that you can just show how uh, important you are, okay? They're just one more tool in your tool belt to help serve. All of it comes from, because we're, we're not fueled by this desire to look important. That's not what fuels us. That's not what motivates us. What fuels us and motivates us is the love of God. Paul wrote this in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15. He said, for it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and motivates us because we are absolutely convinced that he has given his life for all of us. This means all have died with him so that those who live should no longer live self-absorbed lives, but lives that are poured out for him. The one who died for us and now lives again. 
It's God's love that fuels us and motivates us. Because our gifts at times can fail, but love never fails. So whenever you're stepping out, whenever you're taking those risks to grow in your gifts, to develop them, and you feel like you fell flat on your face, at times our gifts can fail, but at the end of the day, love never fails. You can still love the person, love, like you can still exercise love in the situation that you feel like your gift just fell flat. This is where, uh, this is the starting point for the gifts. If, because the, the greatest gift that God has given us came in the form of his son. Okay, what fuels us, what motivates us is God's love because we're absolutely convinced that he gave his life for all of us so that we would no longer live self-seeking, self-absorbed lives. Okay, when you get this, when you, when you are fueled by that kind of love, that's the starting point. And then from there, you have the energy, you have the passion, you have the motivation you need to go out and to discover the gifts that God's given you so that you can develop in them so that we can see our church be strengthened and built up and grow so that we can see cities transformed by Jesus. And it all starts at the cross. It all starts with what Jesus has already done and provided for us. You don't earn these gifts. You don't deserve them. We receive them in the same way that we receive salvation. It is grace that God has given and made available to us. And so that's, that's the tone that we're going to set for this series coming up. We're going to look at these, these gifts as they're being presented, and we're going to view them not in the lens of how important can this make me look. We're going to view it through the lens of how can I use this thing that God has given me to show the character and the nature of God to those around me.